All right, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. I only have a few of you in class at the moment. I think we've got a couple of stragglers that are training and things like that tonight, so no biggie. You guys can catch up later. Uh, those of you that are in class now, does anybody have any questions from uh, um, from past chapters or anything that's popped up since we had uh, over the weekend or anything? No, not really. Okay, good deal. Uh, like I said, just uh, give you guys an opportunity to to uh, to bring up anything. But uh, again, if you have any questions throughout it, just pipe up and let me know. Um, so tonight, as you can see, we're going to be talking about poisoning and substance abuse, uh, something we see a pretty good bit, unfortunately, in this in in our area. So um, you know, it's something that more than likely, sooner than later, you're going to uh, you're probably going to experience. And uh, like I said, it's unfortunate, but, um, you know, we do see it quite often. So, so again, it's, yo, before us get started, uh, is it going to be very long? I was wanting to go see the debate, kind of. <laughs> what time does it start? I don't know if it's seven or eight. I don't know. Uh, it's it's about I think eight o'clock. Eight Eastern or seven. I might see if I can get them recorded at the house. I didn't know. Well, it's uh, I mean, it's about fifty something slides. So, I mean, it shouldn't take too long. All right. We won't ask a bunch of questions then. There you go. As you. <laughs> All right. So. Um, Getting going, you know, there's, uh, you know, substance abuse can mean a lot of different things, right? So there is, um, you know, obviously drug use, alcohol use, you know, in some of the Native American uh, years, several years ago, and some Native American um, tribes and, uh, you know, reservations, they had a big problem with um all all age group like a, a big swath of age groups from young teenagers to uh to older older folks huffing spray paint uh it was just a weird you know kind of a niche thing that uh you know they didn't do crack cocaine they they weren't using a whole lot of crazy hard drugs or anything like that but they would drink alcohol and they would uh they would huff paint and uh and it was really it was going rampant around several uh places in the southwest and uh central part of the country in, in the, the american indian um you know reservation so it, it was uh you know you, you so you can run the gamut of a lot of different types of substance abuse uh type issues but uh nonetheless these these are something that we can do a few things about uh, we'll have some we'll talk about some different um uh, somewhat medications or counter counter counteractions to poisoning poisons and uh, illicit drugs and things like that that we can actually administer um it just kind of depends on where you're at and, and as far as your protocols and uh you know if you're allowed to in your area but nonetheless it's uh you know things that are that are in your repertoire we'll talk about them and um you know for testing purposes so that you understand um kind of what's out there So poison can be classified according to the way the poison enters the body. Okay. So obviously we have what we refer to as routes of exposure. And one of those would be ingestion, obviously through the mouth, uh, being absorbed into the digestive system. Inhalation, where we would breathe it in. Okay. So in through our mouth and nose, absorbs into our mucous membranes and a lot in, in those little those little fibrous lining. And um, it uh, it'll go into our respiratory system. Injection would be the other one. So for it's going through the skin or through into a vein or a vessel of any type, um, you know, so injection could be, could be several different ways, but, uh, but nonetheless, it's through the skin. And then absorption is uh, also through the intact skin. So the skin's not being broken, but it just absorbs through the, the naturally absorbs through the skin. Like fentanyl, it can be absorbed, right? Right. Yeah. Well, it, it could be both. So you can, you could, uh, you could be uh, absorbed through the skin, but you could also, um, if it's if it's aerosolized or if it's in a fine powder, 
uh, you could also inhale it. I've heard you could also, if they were sweating or whatever, you get their sweat on you, depending on how much possibly. Yeah, I mean, that, that'd have to be, because it, it, usually by that time, it's it's already kind of circulated through the system, and you'd have to you'd have to have a pretty pretty strong amount of it uh, for it to do that. So, you know, like I said, going forward here, we're talking a lot about assessments, right? So we, you know, this, this little picture here should kind of look familiar to you. So um, nothing changes, right? We're, we kind of go through the same steps, but depending on how the person is acting, what they have, uh, what they're demonstrating to you uh, may depend on how you go about getting that information. Um, you know, your information may come from, and again, not all these things are, or illicit. They're not all. They're all. They're not always. You know, the police are on the scene and, and things like that. So, uh, just understand that it could be that it's an 89 year old. You know, uh, man who's been in pain for 30 years, and he just he takes. You know, he uh, is overdosing on pain medicine or something like that, right? So, um, it, it doesn't have to be a, a, a you know a street thug who's you know um, getting high every day and and you know attacking people or something like that. So again, we follow that general patient assessment. Um, you know, we, we may have to get, because uh, a lot of times it does, uh, a lot of these things do affect your central nervous system. And so a lot of times they're not really with it. They're kind of incoherent a lot of times. And so we may have to use bystanders, law enforcement, you know, dispatch, you know, things like that to try to get some more information. Um, <clears throat> But like I said, we'll go through several of these, and some of them have uh, little telltale signs there uh, that kind of give it away. But, uh, you know, there are little visual cues that we can look for. And, um, again, much of this stuff depends on the patient signs and symptoms. Like I said, you know, it, it really just kind of depends on what it is, uh, what the poison is or what the um, illicit drug is or something, then, and how, they, how they're going to present themselves. So patient assessment for poisoning, uh, you know, like I said, in, in the history, if they actually have a history, hey, man, you know, we're looking for maybe uh, track marks, you know, scars on their arms, you know, things like that. And that might be something where we kind of and you can ask them. I mean, if, if it's something where we, we think it might be illicit, you know, hey, do you have a history of this? Do you have a history? Do you history you're trying to? you know, maybe commit suicide, you know, if, if that's, if that's what the call is, right. We get that a lot of times where, you know, it's a potential overdose or a potential suicide attempt with, um, you know, with pain medicine or with, you know, all any, any number of different medicines that, that they'll try, but, uh, you know, being able to ask that question of, of, you know, have you ever had to, uh, have you ever done this before? Difficulty breathing, uh, a lot of times it's, it's decreased respirations. You see just a, a decrease in their, uh, again, like I said, their, their central nervous system. So you'll see a decrease in their respiratory rate and drive. Uh, sometimes they will be, uh, especially on the opioid side, they are agonal, like we'd mentioned before, where they're just barely breathing uh, or breathing every, every few seconds, which is, it's just not adequate. So, um, you know, we kind of watch that really close. That's usually kind of our big one that we're, we're, we're concerned with, uh, is their airway and making sure that they, um, is that they have a good open airway and that they're breathing, uh, effectively. So if they're completely unconscious and they are, like we talked about before, when we go start going down that AVPU scale, if, I mean, you can sternal rub the, the heck out of them and they're still not waking up. They're not opening their eyes or not moaning or anything like that, but they're breathing, you know, then we're going to basically just work through that and, and monitor their breathing. If their breathing starts to take a downturn, then that's usually when we're going to start to intervene and, um, and, you know, either do some type of reversal, you know, drug or, um, or we're going to start breathing for them or both. Uh, digestive, you know, it could be nausea and vomiting. So again, with the airway, we want to make sure that we, you know, they hadn't already vomited. It's some, it's not always, uh, you know, with this, but it is a potential. 
and we want to monitor them for that. So if we do happen to have them in their unconscious, then we want to put them in that recovery position and ensure that they are uh, in a safe place. Abdominal pain, diarrhea, same thing. <clears throat> Again, just depends on what they ate and, and how it's absorbing into their bloodstream, uh, absorbing in their stomach. They may um, It may irritate their stomach and cause inflammation or um, any number of gastrointestinal emesis or anything like that. So, like I said, central nervous system, again, they'll be unconscious, have an altered mental status, uh, dilation or constriction of pupils, depending on what it was that they took. Uh, on the opioid side, which we'll get more into, they, um, you know, they're definitely going to be constricted, pinpoint pupils. Convulsions, you know, they may you may see them. Depend, like I said, depending on what they're take, they've taken, it'll be they could have some type of you know muscle jerking that sort of thing. Um, it's almost like a seizure, and um, you know, so it could be confused with a seizure if it may have, is their first time or they're around people who don't know them very well. They don't don't know them to be a, a drug user, then they might confuse that with um, a seizure. So excessive salivation. Uh, they're usually their mouth is, is, uh, getting dry and they, they're want, they're trying to produce more uh, saliva sweating and just in general, uh, rise in body temperature is another one, um, you know, that we look for cyanosis, uh, um, you know, that bluish tint to their skin, uh, or ashiness, uh, to their skin. And we're, we're looking for that. <clears throat> Empty containers at the scene, obviously, if we have pill bottles or, uh, you know, empty, you know, needles or, or syringes, anything like that, uh, we're looking around for those types of things to just kind of help piece together the puzzle. So more than 80% of all uh, cases of poisoning are caused by ingestion. And again, it's just they took too many pills. They, they you know, um, and it, again, it doesn't have to be illicit. It could be accidental poisonings where they, um, you know, it could be a child that um, ingested something from under the under the sink, right, where we keep all our cleaning stuff. Uh, they got in there and and uh, got to it and, and drank it. <clears throat> so looking for stains around their mouth, you know, burns, you need like chemical burns around their mouth, anything like that potentially. Um, you know, think you know the odor coming off their breath. So. Little things like that, just check for, look, you know, take a little bit of a closer look at your patient and, and, and be, be on the lookout for those things. Again, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain as, as some signs and symptoms to be looking for. Again, if they're, especially by ingestion, it's not going to react usually very well with their stomach and their, the body is going to want to get rid of it some kind of way. Later stage, maybe diarrhea, uh, abnormal decreased respirations, loss of consciousness, and then uh, also seizures. So one of the big one of the big ones is we want to try to identify what it was. Uh, you know, especially on the usually when it's an accidental, we can uh, we can usually get that information pretty easy, and we can run it through poison control. National poison control is is fairly easy. You know, there's a 1-800 number. You call the 1-800 number, describe to them what it is. They'll tell you whatever you want to know about it and what the, you know, what the best course of action is. Um, you know, you can do that while you're in route to the hospital, save them a little time. Tell, you know, you can, once you get to, if you get to the, if you're taking them to the hospital when the ambulance gets there, you know, something like that, you can, um, you can give them that information if you already have already gotten it. Uh, you don't have to wait until they get there in order for them to call and all this other stuff. Um, but generally, you know, like I said, we're not calling the poison control center for somebody who, you know, um, took too many Xanax. You know what I mean? It's just it's just one of those things where um, it's uh, it's pretty much already it's it's pretty much already uh, laid out there for for that type of stuff. Um, it's more so for the things that are on the um, commercial market. And that, that usually, that's what they're going to usually give you the most information about. Uh, arrange for a pump transport to the hospital. That's always good. We want to try to get them there as soon as we can and, um, and let them either uh, pump their stomach or give them some type of, uh, you know, reversal uh, drugs or, or something like that or something to make them throw up, you know, something of that nature. 
One of those would be activated charcoal. Uh, again, this is one of those where we're going to talk about it in class. You need to know it for, for testing purposes and what it is and what it does and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but generally, uh, you're probably not going to be the one, one of the ones that does it. Uh, you're going to, the paramedic usually on the ambulance is going to be, have the protocols in place to do that. Uh, so at the first responder level, it is in your skill set, but it's not something that you're going to usually do very much. And more than likely, it'll be uh, outside, out of your scope um, in, by the next edition of this, of this type of course. So, But essentially, it's a finely ground powder mixed with water. Uh, and so uh, just like it says, it's activated. And so you have to, you have to mix it up. And uh, it binds with the poison kind of at a, at a smaller level. Uh, and it prevents the poison from being absorbed into the patient's digestive tract. Okay. So it just, it grabs a hold of it and kind of creates a barrier around it. And, and then it, uh, it'll end up, um, you'll end up either vomiting it or, or passing it and, uh, you know, through the bowels and that sort of thing. Um, we we'll try not to give them if they've had some type of acid, you know, so if it's, um, if, if it's some type of acidic or alkal alkaline, alkaline, alkaline material um, we don't want to give it to them uh, a base as well so if you have a strong acid or a strong base we don't want to give it to them and of course we're not going to give it to them if they're unconscious because they don't they're not able to swallow so uh, we don't want to you know compromise their airway so continue with activated charcoal uh, usual usual dose about 25 to 50 grams for an adult patient and uh, 12 and a half to 25 grams for a pediatric patient. Uh, so it, it's usually, like I said, it usually comes with like a little cup and everything else, and you can drink it through a straw. Or it's, if you try to drink it, it's best to drink it through a straw because if not, it's going to turn your teeth black. Um, so just to kind of save them a little embarrassment or whatever, you know, try to use the cup. Um, just follow the follow the directions on there, mix it to the correct dosage, and like I said, it comes with the cup and you measure it. And make sure that you're given the right the right dosage, and um, and that way you can um, you can administer it appropriately. And um, like I said, I mean either way, their their tongue, their mouth, everything's going to be black for a while. So so you know we we're, we're not going to try to induce vomiting per se. Um, we you know, on the, on the upper level, we, we have, they've had things called syrup of Ipricac, uh, which is something to induce vomiting. Uh, but at this level, we don't do that. Um, and so it's, uh, we're not sticking fingers. We're not, we're not sticking fingers in people's throats. We're not advocating for them to do that themselves. Um, they may have already done that before you arrive, but we're not going to advocate doing that. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, and it, and so, like I said, as it says there, poison control doesn't endorse using Ipecac in children or adults. Um, it's just one of those things. It's just uh, it needs a little bit more oversight in order to, to use that. Um, activated charcoal, like it says, is considered more effective and safer than syrup of Ipecac. Okay, so instead of instead of inducing vomiting, we'd rather you know chemically bind to it and let it just pass on its own. So inhaled poisonings uh, occurs on a toxic substance. It's breathed in, absorbed through the lungs. Uh, and again, like I said, I mean, that could be uh, like, I think it was Charles was talking about earlier about, you know, fentanyl or whatever. There's, you know, there's things that come in different states. So um, it could be aerosolized or it could just be a powder that we inhale. Uh, so that uh, it just depends on, on what, form it's taken on at that time, but it may be, essentially be the same thing. Uh, so carbon monoxide, you know, might be one. So again, that may be one of those, which if, if you guys remember, um, during this last hurricane, Hurricane Laura and stuff like that over in Louisiana, they've had like, I think four deaths or something like that uh, from people running generators in their house. It happens every hurricane. Every single, you know, hurricane where they have a decent amount of loss of power, people run generators inside the house or near. They, they usually run it right by the door so they don't have to go out into the yard or whatever and mess with it and put gas in it and all this other stuff. And the carbon monoxide eventually will slowly 
seep into the, and usually the cord what it is, is the cord is running from it to inside and so the door can't shut all the way or the window can't shut all the way and it seeps in there so it seeps in there and they ultimately end up having you know they may go to sleep and by the time they wake up in six hours or something the uh you know their carbon monoxide rich environment has got it to the point to where they're unconscious or they're dead you know they they do they basically just died of poison of inhale inhaled poison uh poison gas so um it's you know like i said it's very uh it's very important to, to be con concerned about things like that and to, and to be looking for stuff like that uh some other ones uh chlorine gas ammonia very irritating to the respiratory tract um for those of you who are have anything to do with hazmat or, or have potential to do uh anything with hazmat there's a reason why uh the majority of your hazmat technician courses focus almost solely on chlorine gas uh and ammonia it is they are they will kill you fast um and they will they will irritate your lungs uh to the point where essentially you almost drown from the inside out and dry called dry line drowning and it is um you know it's just it is not fun at all so even if you get a little bit of it it's going to damage your lungs uh pretty good and you're going to have a long road you may have uh very long-term health health uh defects because of it uh like i said it's, it's just uh it's one of those things that has to be taken very seriously uh, so for those of you, again, on the fire service side, especially, or law enforcement, if you are responding to something and they, they mention chlorine or they mention ammonia, um, you know, as a, in a, especially in a gaseous form, uh, you need to, you need to slow down and start asking some serious questions and pay attention to where you are uh, in relation to this stuff. All right. Do not go running up in there to try to treat patients or do a rescue or something like that. You really have to pay attention to what you're doing. Uh, inhaled poisons again. Uh, some of the signs and symptoms, as you would, as you might expect, respiratory distress, obviously, uh, burning in the chest, dizziness, uh, of course, a cough, headache, hoarseness, confusion, chest pain. Uh, you know, so th those are kind of pretty common things going along with, you know, with respiratory type issues. <clears throat> uh, so, like we mentioned before, improperly vented heated uh, heating appliances, smoke from burning buildings are uh, common causes of carbon monoxide poisoning uh you may have some some versions where people try to commit suicide by running the car inside uh of a garage that may be one that uh you know that may have some somewhat of an illicit you know effect behind it but um you know and nonetheless we'll, we'll try to treat them as as quickly as possible you get some oxygen in them and things like that but um you know it just kind of depends on how long they've been there uh, headache, nausea, disorientation, unconsciousness, flu-like symptoms. Uh, those again, like I said, maybe some of the ones that are, uh, have been exposed to it over the course of time. You may have some of those flu-like symptoms. And, um, you know, if you find several patients together who all report these symptoms, remove everyone from the structure or vehicle. And that's kind of common sense. But, uh, like I said, it may, that may be one of those things where you're called to a house because everybody woke up and all of a sudden everybody's sick but nobody understands why because they don't smell anything they don't see anything and uh but they all woke up sick right so they're displaying some of these signs and symptoms and you, know, you start looking around right well is there somebody running a car outside is somebody working on a car nearby um you know was there somebody running a generator you know whatever it might be right it could be several different things is there somebody in the neighborhood who has has something like that going on and they left their windows open because they don't have any power you know so it could be could be a, a number of, of reasons but uh but you kind of just start being a detective a little bit and start looking at the, at the uh nature of illness right so the noi so ammonia again is another one of those you see it a lot in uh in agricultural settings it has a strong irritating odor so uh there are there are some of these that are um in their in their base form they are colorless and odorless uh but the manufacturer adds in uh certain uh additives and so that you can smell them and um you know there's some versions of ammonia that 
that uh, don't, there are most versions of ammonia don't need that uh, in its natural state. It is pretty caustic and it will, um, you know, it, it will irritate your, your nasal passage as soon as it, it gets there. Again, highly toxic, um, violent coughing, skin burn. So again, if you get in a, in a strong concentration, you'll get uh, uh, actual, you know, uh, contact burns with the skin. Uh, again, if you if you're going to enter into some type of environment like that, you're going to need to have some type of it definitely self-contained breathing apparatus and probably an, an encapsulated suit that will cover all of your your skin and, and expose body parts and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, so it just kind of depends on what you have available and and what the situation is. You may have to have a specialized group of people or team or something like that in order to be able to do that. It was it was pretty big. Uh, anhydrous ammonia was really big uh, several years ago when certain types of methamphetamine production was going on. That was a big uh, precursor uh, chemical in uh, methamphetamine manufacturing, and people were going around stealing farmers' anhydrous ammonia. So we actually have one. A guy and his buddy were. Um, out here on Highway 26 at a fertilizer place, and uh, I'm actually not far from my house right here. And they um, they tried to uh, break into a high pressure um, tank and fill up a bunch of small bottles with anhydrous ammonia to go back and make their meth. And they uh, it, the valve failed on them and ended up spraying one of them like right in the face or something. I think he died and. Um, the other one was severely burned, uh, had, uh, you know, you know, skin burns. And then, um, his airway was also compromised and he was, uh, had severe breathing problems and everything else. We ended up, I think we ended up flying him out or whatever. We had Highway 26 shut down all night and it was, it was a big deal. We had, you know, had to have a hazmat team and all sorts of stuff. And we had to evacuate a small area. Because uh, some of these things are low lying and they'll kind of hug down to the ground, and so uh, we were concerned about it getting into people's homes and air conditioning systems and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> so again, chlorine, uh, you know, a lot of times if you're not familiar with it, you may you may think of it as like uh, something that we clean stuff with or something. You know, I hear about it in swimming pools and th things like that. And that is, um, that's true. I mean, you, you find it usually in the powder form uh, that way or in a, like a, a liquid form, uh, liquid chlorine uh, for your laundry or something of that nature. But uh, it uh, comes in a, in a gas form also. And um, it is, uh, again, very, very dangerous and it will kill you very fast. Um, you know, it essentially, you know, if you get a little bit of it, it's going to irritate your respiratory system so bad that you're not going to be able to function very well. Um, you're not going to be able to breathe well enough to run away. I'll put it to you like that. Um, if you take it, if you take a big breath of it, like one seriously good full breath in a concentrated area, you're you're not going to you're probably not going to make it out of there. You're probably not going to be able to run away. Um, you're, you're gonna you're gonna be so um, respiratory compromised that you're not gonna be able to breathe well enough to run away. Um, so uh, that's why we tell you to really take caution when dealing with this. Um, it, even 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 though we have patients that may be in visual sight and they are having the, you know having some type of reaction similar reaction to that. Um, it, you just do not have unless you have the right PPE to go in there. Um, you, know, you just can't do it. It's unfortunate, but that's one of those things where um, we, uh, you know, we'd like to be able to risk our life to save somebody else's life. But that's one of those where you're going to give your life trying to save their life. OK, um, it's just not worth it. And, um, you know, like I said, more, more, more than likely they're going to be severely injured anyway uh, or, or probably going to die, uh, depending on how long they've been in it. So it's very uh, it's a tough decision to make. But again, some of these things just like. Patients with, you know, down power lines on the car, you know, we're just not going to go near it. Uh, the ground gradient of those power lines is going to probably shock us too. And luckily, they're more, if they're in the vehicle, more than likely they're going to be a little bit insulated because of the tires. And, uh, and so they're, they're a little bit more um, protected than we would be. 
And so, you know, it, it's best just to call in those specialized folks, let them do their job, and uh, and we'll deal with whatever the aftermath is. So again, the presence of hazardous materials that are, that are toxic and those in which there is a danger of fire explosion should be indicated by the appropriate placards. So these placards are um, on a lot of different types of mobile uh, or transportable uh, hazardous material. And that's generally what these are for. Uh, if you have um, stationary based uh, hazardous materials, you may be dealing with the 704 placard, um, which is essentially a, still a triangle like this, uh, but it looks a little bit different, has uh, some little four little quadrants in it and has some numbers on it, some like single digit numbers, uh, one, two, three, things like that in each each one. And then it may have some pictures on there. So um, what you're seeing here is uh, the four digit number is referred to as the UNID number, UNID number. And that UNID number is uh, also referred to as a CAS number, CAS number. And you can reference this in a couple of different ways. Um, the emergency response guidebook is out there. It's a free book that lists the majority, the vast majority of these uh, hazardous materials that are uh, transported. So you can look in there in that book and look up that four digit number, um, you know, say 1075 or 1016, 1017 for a chlorine and, you know, any, any of these different types of numbers that you might find. You can take a second, look through some binoculars, look in that book and see kind of what it is. Uh, the, the single digit on the bottom there, the, you see the threes and the nine, the eight, those represent the nine hazard classes. Um, when we're dealing with um, hazardous materials, we lump them into nine hazard classes. So, uh, you know, it's a uh, number one would be explosives, and then it kind of goes into flammable liquids, flammable solids, um, you know, uh, alkalines and corrosives, and and several different things, all the way all the way down to even miscellaneous, where it's just kind of generalized hazardous. And it's not really specific um, in the nine hazard class. So. Um, but each one of those numbers, like I said, represents uh, something that you can research and even the colors kind of correspond. So obviously the red is something flammable. You see the flame there, flammable. Uh, so that's one of those that we can kind of research. You can look at it, even just, just visually looking at it, you can tell the one with the black and the, the uh, you see the little beakers and that's a corrosive, right? So if you research a little bit, do a little training on it, uh, it doesn't take much. You can look at those and go, okay, that's a corrosive. I don't know what kind of corrosive. I don't know what it is, but I can see it's a hazard class eight and um, has a little picture on there. That's going to be a corrosive, right? If it's red, it has a flame on it, it's going to be some, it's going to be flammable to some degree, right? So uh, flammable liquid or flammable solid. So inhaled poisons, you know, uh, a lot of times we want to, the biggest thing is just to get them out of that area. So get them to a better uh, atmosphere, uh, usually a more oxygen uh, rich atmosphere. And and we want to just try to remove whatever that source of that uh, inhaled gas or poison is. And once we do that, usually their patient will start to improve to some degree. Uh, but nonetheless, um, if we we're going to, do our assessment as we normally would. We're going to check for uh, airway, breathing, and circulation, and making sure that we have a good patented airway, and um, and that we the patient is breathing adequately. Um, so, and if we if they're not, then we're going to be able to, we're going to start breathing for them, right? Uh, a lot of times when we're doing that, we still want to try our best to administer a uh, high flow oxygen. Again, irregardless, we want to try to find out what it is. So if, before we leave the scene with our patient, we want to make sure that we kind of have a general idea of what, what it was. Okay. It's, it's pretty important uh, that they know at the hospital what, uh, what, it, what generally it was. And if you can find out what specifically it was, that's great. And, uh, and that'll make uh, their treatment a, a lot more um, concise. So injected poisons, uh, Again, same thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be illicit 
you know, um, where somebody's, you know, shooting up or whatever. Uh, it could be from an animal bite or sting, uh, and you could have some something of that nature. And, um, you know, it could be also something where you have, um, you know, some, there's there's something poisonous, you know, on a surface and then it ends up cutting into your skin, you know, that sort of thing. So that may be some type of injection uh, roundabout. Um, but um, but then, of course, toxic injection, like like we were mentioned before, where they're actually shooting up or something of that nature. Uh, with the bites and stings, obviously, you may have uh, obvious injuries. So you may have a swollen area, you know, spider bites, depending on what type of spider. You could have a big, uh, we call a wheel, W-H-E, and it essentially has a... a you know, a red, a red center and it starts to get darker on the outside. Uh, you know, so you could have an obvious uh, injury there. Tenderness, swelling, uh, you know, red streaks radiating from the injection uh, site. <clears throat> Weakness, dizziness, localized pain, itching. You know, so it kind of depends on what phase um, you're in, so how long it's been uh, since the, since the biter sting. Again, a lot of times these, you know, take they take a little bit. They have to get into your bloodstream and actually, you know, go to your brain or go to your heart and things like that in order for it to uh, to start really taking effect. So, um, other other than just the actual, you know, pain at the site, but uh, so it may take a second for for some of these effects to kick in. But uh, if we can try to wash the site with soap and water, if there's a stinger there, try to remove it using. Um, yeah, obviously you want to have your PPE on. You don't want to get, you know, that stuff, you know, you don't want to inadvertently stick yourself with it or have it get on you. So um, a lot of times you take a, a kind of like a, a little piece of uh, like a tongue depressor or, or um, uh, tweezers or something like that and, and just kind of scrape it out. And that will, uh, you know, help to also remove some of that. Sometimes it's still after, even after that stinger is left in there, it is still producing some type of, um, uh, venom or poison or something of that nature. So um, try to apply some ice packs, reduce the swelling and the pain. This is just general, you know, pain management. Um, wound care 101 is just, uh, you know, that ice is going to help to reduce swelling and, and, and which in turn reduces pain. So depending on the, um, depending on the patient, you may have, they may be allergic to a bite or sting. All right, a lot of people are, are um, allergic to bees. Okay. Um, so you may want to, uh, you know, they may have some type of, they may have already have known that and they may have some type of, uh, medication that we're going to talk about here in a minute to, to help them. Uh, but they could go into what they refer to as anaphylactic shock. Um, so essentially shock due to, um, poisoning or allergic reaction. So those uh, signs and symptoms, itching, hives, so these little bumps on the skin, swelling. Uh, so a lot of times with this, a big thing we're worried about an anaphylactic shock or anaphylaxis is uh, respiratory compromise. Okay, uh, so that's why we want to try to recognize it early. If they do have some type of uh, auto injector or medication that they take, um, we want them to, to do it pretty quickly and that will reduce the potential for, um, that, that respiratory compromise. So that wheezing would come from that, you know, uh, narrowing of the airway, uh, generalized weakness, loss of consciousness, potentially sometimes they're just overwhelmed and may, may pass out just because of the stress of the whole thing. Uh, rapid weak pulse. Again, the body is just trying to compromise for, for some of the stuff. And so that heart rate is going to come up the same thing with the breathing. It's going to start to get rapid and a bit shallow and uh, hypovolemic shock. Yeah, it's, it's again, that's just a potential, but it's uh, not necessarily something that uh, is going to be prevalent in, in most patients. So again, treat the ABCs. Like we mentioned before, airway is a big one, making sure that the airway doesn't close off. Uh, if we can administer oxygen, and then uh, treat for shock in, in those cases where they are exper experiencing that. Um, you know, we want to, um, you know, raise their feet, raise their head a little bit, uh, get their, um, you know, get their tight clothes 
loosen their tight, any tight clothing, uh, keep them warm, that sort of thing. So like I said, we want to try to remove that allergen as best we can. So if they do happen to have, they're allergic to something, um, we want to try to get that either off of them or out of them as soon as we can and help to alleviate that. Um, monitor the vital signs, you know, try to, like I said, try to treat for shock and, uh, and apply O2. The, the obviously, like we mentioned before, if that airway compromise goes into uh, respiratory arrest, then we're going to start to breathe for them. If that, if that respiratory arrest leads into cardiac arrest, we're going to start CPR as we normally would. And of course, we're going to transport as quickly as we can. So talking about auto injectors earlier, uh, usually uh, uh, atropine or something like that, and they will usually prescribe to them, and they can uh, they can inject it themselves. We're not going to inject it for them. Uh, we're only going to assist them with that. And that, um, but essentially, how it how it works is that there's a safety cap on there. We'll take that safety cap off. Uh, be very careful that you do not put your hand in front of that auto injector. All right, an adult auto injector will go through a quarter inch, uh, I mean, a half inch sheet of plywood. Okay, uh, Google it. If you don't believe me, Google it. Now, there's there's videos on it. Um, it's made to it's made to work. You know, regardless, it's go, it's gonna it's gonna go right into the muscle and it's gonna um, it's gonna do its job. So, um, so essentially, what you do is you. Uh, put it up against the skin. Provide point. And once you get that safety uh, cap off, and you basically take the safety uh, that safety mechanism out of there, then it's you don't want to have your hand anywhere near it. Grab it from the back, like you see in the picture. Um, watch your fingers as you hold on, as you kind of uh, stabilize the, the leg. It's going to go right into the directly into the side uh, of the leg at the at the biggest part of the thigh on the outer side. Uh, and that'll be the lateral side, and then firmly press against the thigh. You don't. We're not jamming it on there. We're pushing steadily. Okay, so we're just going to push it, again, put it against the skin, and then push it in. Um, and it's going to it's going to auto uh, inject the needle. Will come out. Uh, hold it there for for just a few seconds, and it will release the medic medication. And then we can pull it out and we can discard it. So talking about snake bites, uh, four kinds of venomous snakes in the United States, rattlesnakes, cottonmouth, copperhead, coral snakes. You know, there's several different versions of these. You know, it's good to, you know, every now and then look over some of these just so you have an idea what, what they look like. You know, if you've grown up around the South, you more than likely have, uh, have probably, you know, heard some different little ways of telling the difference between coral snakes and, and other snakes and, and uh, same way with rattlesnakes. And so it's just one of those things where, you know, it's not a bad part of your repertoire. Just, you know, if you're an outdoors person or, um, or, or, or a medical provider, you know, it's, it's just good things to know. So a snake injects its poison to a person's skin and muscles with its fangs. Okay. So it's kind of like that auto injector goes in and it just, it just, uh, it'll, it'll pump for uh, quite a while, you know, so, uh, but it doesn't take much. It, uh, if it stays in there, it will, uh, you know, it'll do some serious damage. But a lot of times, even that that one strike, that I mean, just a half a second, uh, you know, that uh, as soon as they make contact, they're injecting. Okay, so it's a it's a toss up how much you're going to get injected with, but um, you know, you can get a little bit or you can get a lot, and uh, either way, it's not good. Obviously, you're going to have immediate pain at the bite site, swelling and tenderness around the bite. Uh, again, just fainting. Some people just faint from the sight of, of a snake or, or from being bit. Uh, they think they're going to die. Uh, sweating, nausea and vomiting, shock. Again, some of these are nausea and vomiting, usually late stages, and the shock as well. Uh, so if, if, the, if it is more of like a neurotoxin, it will you know, it will start to kind of have an, a, a pretty adverse effect on your uh, on your body as a whole. You know, you're you're going to get cramps. You'll get, like I said, nausea, vomiting, shock, sweating, things like that. Uh, 
blurred speech, slurred speech, paralysis potentially in that area, coma, seizures. So it, it really just kind of depends on what it is. This, you know, as you see, this one's talking about a, a coral snake, uh, but some of the other ones as well uh, have that potential to, to have some pretty serious effects um, if it if it goes untreated. Big thing, keep them calm, right? So again, remember this thing, this stuff is going to go through the bloodstream, it has to go through the muscle, then get in the bloodstream and all that. So if we can, if we can try to keep our patient calm, lower their heart rate, I mean, lower their breathing, which in turn lowers their heart rate, which in turn makes the heart pump a little bit slower, which in turn keeps the venom from getting into the stream as fast. OK, so that's one of those things that we don't need a bunch of fancy equipment to do. Calm the patient down. It's going to help. It's going to help, you know, slow down that process. All right. Uh, wash the bite area with soap and water. That's that's kind of an infection control thing. If they're, um, you know, especially d depend on the animal and, and the snakes are just, you know, not the cleanest and they will uh, help to reduce uh, infection at the bite site. Uh, we try not to have them move a whole lot. We don't want them, you know, moving that bite side around, flexing their hands, that sort of thing. If it's in their arm, same with their feet. We don't want them moving their legs around. Um, treat the patient carefully. You know, like I said, later stage, if, they, if it's been a little while, they're going to be in some pretty serious pain. They're just going to start to work its way throughout the rest of the limb. They're going to have a lot of pain. So absorbed poison, so, you know, poisons, like I said, that's, that's going to kind of go through that porous, you know, skin, the virus, and um, it's uh, it's going to, you know, soak through there. And a lot of times, you know, like like you said, there are some illicit drugs that, that may, may may do that. Uh, insecticides, toxic industrial chemicals uh, are some of those that, you know, just in the right concentration, uh, it's it's going to potentially, you know, burn our skin or and get absorbed into it. And uh, it may take a little while, a little bit longer. This is probably one of the longer um, routes. The other thing, like if you think back to CPR, uh, we talked about medication patches. So somebody having a medication patch on their chest for uh, pain or smoking or something like that, they, um, you know, that is a what they refer to as a transdermal um medication patch so that medication gets into this gets into the skin you know through that absorption process so if you're not wearing your gloves or if you're not careful with what you're doing with it and you you know all of a sudden it sticks on your arm or something like that you have the potential if you leave it there long enough for it to for you to get a little bit and there have been cases where people have done that and you know 15 minutes later they're having a headache because they got a big dose of pain medicine that they didn't need, you know, and so now they have a headache or they're they're nauseous or something like that. So traces of powder or uh, skin on the uh, liquid on the skin and inflammation or redness of the skin. Uh, some of those other signs and symptoms, obviously, are the actual burns themselves to the skin, uh, skin rash or redness, burning, itching, nausea, vomiting, dizziness and shock. Um, you know, big thing is. You know, copious amounts of water. Um, if if that's all you have, um, if you can if you can brush it off, brush it off. But again, make sure that you are having you have something on there. Uh, you know, it says like it says, contact with water may activate the dry chemical and result in a burning reaction. Uh, again, the only thing the only thing that I'd tell you is if you wash it, it needs to be washed with copious amounts of water, not just a splash or a wet rag or something. You need to like turn the hose on it. Okay. Um, and really and really wash it off um, that way it completely gets rid of it um, and like I said is there wash the patient completely for at least 20 minutes so it needs to get a, 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 again a copious amount of water uh, but again for these dry type things we prefer you to try to brush them off uh, instead of using uh, just light water or something of that nature So again, same thing. We want to try to find out what it was, if possible, and that way we can uh, let EMS know, um, you know, what uh, or, or let poison control know, so we can let EMS know uh, what um, 
what potential treatment we might need to take. So like we mentioned before, you know, general treatment for shock, elevate the legs and uh, have the patient, you know, have the patient lie down, elevate the legs, uh, keep them warm and make sure that uh, we're trying to, you know, increase that, that blood flow to the, uh, to the main parts of the body. And then in general, you know, if they're having difficulty breathing, we can uh, administer oxygen, you know, if, if they're, you know, it's also a potential for them to, uh, if, especially if it's a dry powder or something of that nature for them to have inhaled some of that too. So uh, applying oxygen is, is not a bad idea. All right, nerve agents. Uh, this is something that we dealt with a whole lot in the military. Um, we, uh, you know, but nonetheless, it, it's made its way into the civilian world. The, um, there's been numerous terrorist attacks across the across the world dealing with um, you know uh, illicit um, you know nerve agents and um, uh, other other types that we're going to talk about here in a little bit other types of uh, terroristic type um, you know blood agents and and all sorts of different things uh, that affect us in different ways. So nerve agents uh, can be absorbed through the skin, inhaled or injected. They're Again, some of the most deadly uh, chemicals out there, and it's for for that reason. And small quantities can kill large numbers. So some of you may have seen some of these movies over the years, especially in the '90s. That was the big deal, where you know they always had you know some terrorist who made some type of uh, you know um, nerve agent, and they were going to wipe out a whole city if they didn't give them you know a gazillion dollars, right? Uh, and then some superhero special forces guy comes in and like captures and kills everybody and you know right so um but it's it's not it's not necessarily far-fetched it's it's uh it's hard to get but done but in small quantities it could still take out a large number of people and that's kind of what they're getting at um and it, it will it will do just severe damage it, even in a in a small to moderate quantity um it will uh, do some pretty nasty things to your body and and you'll you'll die a painful death uh, unfortunately some of these uh, the the big four here are uh sarin uh soman tabin and v agent or vx uh so vx gas if you ever uh you know if you ever watched uh alcatraz the movie with uh, sean connery and nicholas cage that's what they were. That's what they all were all worried about was the rockets full of VX gas. Um, so again, they were talking about a, a droplet that uh, that would um, uh, wipe out the entire city of San Francisco. This is something you need to write down, highlight, print out, whatever you want to do um, as it as it were, as it applies to nerve agents. Okay, this acronym you need to be familiar with, and it's referred to as sludge. M it used to be just be sludge, but they added the M there at the bottom. Uh, so salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal upset, emesis, and muscle twitching or meiosis pinpoint pupils. These are essentially the things that uh, that kind of show themselves at different stages uh, after being exposed to um, nerve agents. Okay. And ultimately, it's going to it's going to get in there. It's going to like it says there. It's going to kind of block off those receptor sites of the nerve and not allow them to have the transmission to the brain uh, that they should. And so a lot of these things will be involuntary. So you're just going to start uh, again salivating or sweating, uh, excessive crying, uh, urination, uh, again uh, defecating or or diarrhea. Uh, gastrointestinal upset and cramps are just severe stomach cramps, uh, vomiting, and again, muscle twitching, and then pinpoint pupils. So, again, one of those deals where I uh, hope you're not in the environment that they're in. You need to get the if they're been exposed to some of this stuff, uh, you really need to protect yourself and you need to uh, ensure that you get them out as soon as possible and uh, that they are don't take any of that stuff with them all right so this is definitely a uh hazmat type 
uh, team type response uh, to something like this. And you're going to need to get them cleaned off, hosed off, uh, decontaminated as soon as possible. Again, uh, this is some of those for organophosphate poisons, and those are generally some of the same ones. Uh, as you can see there, it says paralysis, uh, loss of consciousness. All these uh, late stages are going to have paralysis and loss of consciousness. Uh, nerve agents, you know, organophosphates, any of those are going to have, are going to have, you're going to go through that, almost through that whole realm of, um, of issues. And again, it's not, it's not nice at all. Okay. I, I don't know how to, how else to put it to you. It's a, uh, it's just a, it's a very, very bad time for your patient. Uh, you know, like I said, like, like I mentioned to you before, well-trained hazmat team is going to have to be in protective clothing to usually to, to remove these people and get them to you. Uh, generally at, at our level, uh, if, if you're encountering something like this, there's going to be a lot of other people there. Uh, there's going to be a lot of other highly specialized people there, um, and they're going to get uh, whisked away to uh, a specialized treatment facility uh, that can deal with them and um, and give them the correct uh, medications and stuff like that to help try to counteract it. Uh, <clears throat> there is some stuff out there that we use in the military, and if you're if you're around, like say if you're around some type of facility that made some of the stuff or anything, or that housed it or whatever. Uh, and that's the reason why you might be responding to it. Um, you might be familiar with, um, you know, atropine and 2-PAM chloride, uh, which are some of the things that uh, the auto injectors for nerve agent uh, that try to counteract nerve agent uh, exposure. And again, that's something that the military teaches you. You keep it with you and things like that if you're in, if you're in, a, in a location that would normally have that. Uh, potential and um but um but again you don't you're not going to see it very often so like i mentioned before um the uh abcs uh, you know so again if for some reason you are you are having a patient like this and and, and you're with them for any amount of time uh biggest thing is just keep yourself protected keep your patient protected uh, get them cleaned off, get them out of that area. And, um, and then if, if they have uh, a nerve agent antidote kit, which is what I was just talking about, um, atropine and two pam chloride, then you will, um, you know, they'll, you'll either assist them with administering it, or you may, uh, you may have to administer it yourself. Just depends on the situation. But generally, again, like I said, if you're in that environment, you'll, you will have probably already trained on, be trained on how to uh, administer those. It's a multi-step process. So like it says there, follow your little pro local protocol. So just in general, it's kind of similar to what we were talking about earlier. Um, and with the other auto injector, check the kit, make sure it's, it's uh, you know, the medication is not expired. It's, it's good stuff. Uh, we're going to remove the gray protective cap. Press the green end of the injector firmly against the lateral part of the patient's thigh, same exact location. Uh, press it against there and hold it for 10 seconds and let the, let the medication get into the muscle. Dispose of the syringe in a medical sharps container, which is just a, a hard plastic box, and reassess the uh, patient's vital signs. The, uh, the, a lot of times they'll, they'll both deploy or one will deploy and you'll end up having a you want to try to keep track of that. If for some reason, like I said, it'd be a specialized situation where you would do that uh, at the EMR level. And if you, when you do that, make sure that you keep track of that, uh, that you've administered it. And especially if you're going to administer more than one. Um, but generally in this situation, we're only administering one. So just keep track of it and let, uh, let the next uh, higher level of care know uh, what you gave them and how much. All right, we'll take, go ahead and take 10 before we get into substance abuse and uh, take 10 minutes and we'll come back to it.
All right, buddy, we'll go ahead and get back started. So going into substance abuse, so we kind of talked a little bit about it, uh, some of these things here and there um, tonight, but uh, we'll kind of get into some of it a little bit more specifically. And that's substance abuse. So again, that's something where uh, somebody is abusing certain things. And like I said, it could be anything from, you know, um, over the counter medications. It could be, uh, you know, like I said, spray paint. Uh, you know, some people will um, abuse, um, you know, different types of, like I said, over the counter type uh, cold medicines and things of that nature. Um, uh, you know, all the way up to, you know, crack cocaine and heroin and methamphetamine and all these other types of drugs. So, uh, you know, it is a it is a big problem. It's a, it's, it's an epidemic of its own uh, for for quite a while now uh, in our country and in and across the world. Alcohol is one of those. Been around, obviously, been around a long, long time uh, in, in various forms, long before um, you know Anheuser Busch or or any of the the big name companies have have been around. Uh, you know, alcohol is there. Um, so, and, uh, you know, in it, in its general form, it has, you know, great, uh, medicinal properties as, as a, you know, as a cleanser and, you know, to, to clean things, you know, we've been cleaning our hands with it for the last several months now, uh, habitually, uh, with some form of alcohol, you know, so, um, but in its, you know, consumable format, it's, uh, you know, again, also, uh, has its has its issues, so uh, that's one of those things that it, it's in, been involved in a lot of different things uh, when it's been abused, obviously. Um, so everybody has their own stance on alcohol use, but abuse obviously is not uh, not something that um, you know should be tolerated. But it's a uh, you know significant number of traffic fatalities, murder, suicides. Uh, you know, accidental deaths, and, and all sorts of different types of things that have been associated with it. <clears throat> so if you take that, take medical, I'm mean, sorry, excuse me, take alcohol and you mix it with other types of medical uh, illnesses or severe injuries and you can um, exacerbate, you know, uh, your, your symptoms um, even more. So some of those, some of those things that you're dealing with may be kind of masked by that and in, and you're not really going to you may not you may not get a, a, a good exam or a good history uh, because of that. So uh, it's important to take your time, be patient and uh, and kind of work, you know, work around uh, these people that are that are intoxicated. Uh, again, alcohol is an addictive depressant drug. Um, persons physically dependent on alcohol can develop severe withdrawal symptoms. Uh, so again, that's not your average recreational, uh, have a few beers kind of, kind of person. Uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, severe symptoms, delirium tremors, uh, which, which you may have heard is called DTs. And, um, you know, they, they seriously, just like any other drug addict, they need, uh, they need it. They need that, uh, that consumption for them to, to, you know, what they feel like would be re to regulate themselves. Uh, again, a lot of different, a lot of different versions of signs and symptoms with D from people that are in DTs, um, and shaking restlessness or is, you know, pretty common. Uh, usually their, uh, mannerism or their, I'm sorry, their, um, their, the way that they deal with it will change. So a lot of times they'll get aggravated, uh, mad, upset, that sort of thing. You know, if you're trying to keep it from them. And uh, keep them from from uh, you know getting to it. Uh, you're gonna you'll have them um, generally be in some uh, some type of you know excited state. Well, I'm let my slides catch up here.
There we go. All right. So again, confusion, hallucinations. Uh, again, these are some of the later stage ones. Uh, gastrointestinal distress, chest pain, fever, so cramping, hallucinations, confusion. Uh, these are, again are some of the, the more late stage signs and symptoms that you might see. Uh, again, it's it's a it's a serious medical emergency. Once it gets to that point, you know it's not just oh he needs a drink and and he needs to get over it, you know whatever uh, or she, but it is uh, but in turn it it has started to take a multi system effect on the body. So it's obviously affecting the brain, uh, which is then then going and uh, affecting. Uh, gastrointestinal, you know, uh, chest pain, all these, uh, you know, several different uh, facets and areas of the body. So it's, uh, it's important to get them to um, get to some treatment and get them to uh, get them to a hospital. So drugs, which again is a very generalized term, um, you know, could be, like I said, over the counter, could be uh, prescription uh, it could be man-made, you know, so there's a lot of different, uh, a lot of different things here. Uh, again, ingested, inhaled, injected, absorbed. So all these routes of entry that we talked about are, are potentials there. Um, we look for clues as to how that might have been administered. So like we mentioned before about, you know, we refer to it as track marks for puncture wounds, um, discoloration to the uh the hand in between the fingers uh in the the ac joint of the elbow so the the antecubital fossa that bend the elbow uh the patient's not wearing socks you know look between the toes uh in the stomach around the lower stomach area uh you know so there's several different places where you might see injection uh uh places like that and uh, like i said depends on what it is you know just talking about the um, the spray paint, right? I mean, you might have discoloration to the, around the, the mouth and nose. So it uh, just depends on what it is. So am amphetamines in general, uh, oh, wow, these slides are taking a while to catch up. Bear with me, folks. Are you guys seeing amphetamines on your screen or no? Yeah, I see. Uh, it says drugs two of twelve, amphetamine stimulants, central nervous system. Okay, all right. It's just not showing up on my on my other screen here, where it, where it says you guys can see it. So, anyway, uh, so amphetamines um, uh, stimulate the, the stimulates the central nervous system. It goes by a lot of different names. Uh, there's even more out there now. Uh, ice crystal, cocaine. You know, there's. There's, again, like I said, several different names out there for them, slang, street names. Uh, restlessness, irritability, talkativeness. Um, it, it's, I mean, I see it almost daily, uh, unfortunately, in, in our county, the county I work in. So, I mean, I, I've, I, I literally, I see this almost daily. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, once, you, once you know these signs, you can pick it out, you know, in a snap of a finger uh, you know, it doesn't take you about 30 seconds and you can, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to tell. So, um, the, you know, one of the biggest things is trying to keep them calm and keep them from harming themselves, um, you know, or, or other people, you know, so like I said, their, their restlessness can be through the roof and irritability and stuff like that. So it's one of those things where you really kind of have to just keep them calm don't focus on talking about you know what they took and all this other stuff but you guys hang on one second
All right, guys. So, you know, some other things to think about, too, is that the some of these things have been around, you know, amphetamines in general, uh, like I said, it's kind of a generalized term and incorporates a lot of different things. And there's, you know, there's stuff out there that was over the counter that was had a little bit of amphetamine in it, uh, you know, that there was a. Uh, there are some cold medicines and things like that that people would uh, abuse uh, over the counter. Uh, some some different types of uh, you know consumable products that that were out there that had it in it, and um, and people would realize this. Excuse me, realize this, and end up using it for. You'd have college kids who would use it to try to stay awake so they could study and things like that. Uh, truck drivers and 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 you know um, people that that work the night shift to try to stay awake and all this other stuff and it ended up they ended up abusing it over time because they they realized that it gave them other effects that uh, that made them feel good you know so um, so these those types of things uh, can come in a lot of different forms so pain relievers or opioids you, may, you heard me talk about that earlier uh, and heroin. Uh, so hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, and codeine. Uh, so oxy, oxycodone, also referred to as oxycotton, and uh, just another uh, name for hydrocodone might be Vicodin. The uh, the opioids that we see, like you know, we talked about fentanyl earlier, and heroin. Uh, sometimes they're they're kind of go together, and they. They're, they're obviously, you know, again, another one of those epidemics, like we mentioned before, that's uh, all around the country. And, uh, you know, they are definitely prevalent in our society right now. And I can tell you, again, just from my professional background, that they're, it's alive and well uh, right down the street from most of us um, and good, nice, normal people. And, you know, street thugs and, and criminals and everything else like that as well. So um, don't think just because you're going to a nice neighborhood and a nice house that you're not going to be, that you don't have the potential for this. Okay. Um, and that's with a lot of things. You know, that's with organized crime. That's with drugs uh, of many types, you know, um, you know, and, and several other different types of criminal behavior. So, <clears throat> There, uh, you know, don't uh, don't put the blinders on when it comes to stuff like this. Uh, Want to try to be objective and and try to you know be impartial and that sort of thing uh, while we're dealing with our patients. But just understand and make sure that you are watching your back. You have you know you have uh, people there supporting you and making sure in law enforcement and all that sort of stuff. So signs and symptoms for opioid drug overdose: uh, slow, difficult, shallow breathing. Like I said, if it is an actual overdose. Um, you will generally have that uh, slow, difficult, per, uh, slow and shallow breathing for sure, and sometimes no breathing, uh, depending on what how much they took. And uh, small or pinpoint pupils—that's one of the uh, a very telltale sign uh, that we look for. Uh, weak pulse, low blood pressure, bluish nails and lips are, are a pretty common one that we see. Uh, drowsiness and disorientation, again, another one that kind of goes with the shallow breathing. Uh, we see that quite often. Uh, usually one will ro roll into the other, so they'll be kind of drowsy and won't wake up and that sort of thing. And then they'll, that will progress into shallow breathing, slow breathing, no breathing. Uh, delirium and coma, again, usually late stages. Uh, and usually when they've had something that's been laced with something else, an opioid drug laced with something else that has a kind of a bad reaction to it, and it, it uh, hits them a little bit harder than than normal. I can tell you what I see most often is that they will overdose. Um, they will generally uh, what will appear to be stop breathing uh, to, to most normal people, and then they, uh, which would just be really shallow breathing. And we get there, and uh, they are uh, alert and oriented to painful stimulus uh, or no stimulus. And so they're fully unconscious and then they will, but they're still usually, they're usually still breathing to some degree. And we sit there, we monitor their breathing and, um, you know, a small percent of the time they need to be, they need an oral pharyngeal airway and a bag valve mask. And generally that uh, respiratory um, 
once we start to breathe for them uh, a few times, that generally will spark their respiratory drive back, and they will uh, they'll start breathing back on their own. And usually, shortly thereafter, once they get a little uh, oxygen in their system, they will um, they'll come back around. And uh, you know, I've had a Narcan several people, but they generally uh, a lot of times they'll come back out of it. But like I said, it's not. Don't take that to be uh, the case with with every patient. That's just one of those things where uh, that's what I've seen more more so in this area of how it happens. But um, but I've also had, to, like I said, I've had we've had to bag mask people, we've had to intubate people, do CPR on people, Narcan people, all this other sort of stuff. So um, so on that, talking about Narcan or naloxone is the actual name of it, of the drug. Um, Narcan is just kind of a trade name that you see. The um, It's generally for, for a long, for, for a very long time, since since literally maybe two years ago, um, it was a very regulated drug, just like anything else. Uh, it was only given by the paramedic uh, or the doctor at the hospital. And... Um, and is essentially helps to rapidly reverse the effects of the opioid drug for a short period of time. Okay, let me stress that for a short period of time. So um, the essentially the receptor site it will that drug will help to get uh, cover that receptor site so that that the drug doesn't uh, get into that receptor site uh, and affect it. And that will that kind of helps protect it. And um, generally, when you do that, uh, they will literally, uh, within just a maybe a minute or so, minute to two, they will come right out of whatever they they have going on. And um, generally, they're going to be extremely surprised and very agitated. Okay, so. Uh, it behooves you to be prepared for that. Um, you need to really watch. Uh, you know, as soon as, as soon as you do that, you need to. I would keep a hand on them. I would have law enforcement around that sort of thing to to make to make uh, darn sure that um, they don't uh, stand up swinging because we've had them do everything in between. We've had them just open their eyes and start looking around in amazement and just you know be real nice and everything uh, and, and lethargic. And we've had them pop their eyes open, jump straight up from the ground, and take off running. Okay, so um, again, this this type of thing can happen in any location. Could happen in, in a vehicle while they're driving. Uh, could be hap you know happen just at home in the bed, uh, in a yard on the side of the highway. I mean, in any number of things, right? So sometimes when they get those when the effects of the drug or the opioid, you know, is kind of in in mid. Uh, midstream they'll just they'll go for a walk they'll they'll want to they'll want to go uh you know see somebody or do whatever and so they're in transit somehow and um uh, and so you have to be prepared for that uh a lot of times nowadays it's uh it's available in intranasal uh administration uh or auto injection generally what you see now is the nasal spray and it's um it's usually in like 4 milligram uh, dosage, intranasal, doesn't matter which one. And uh, so we'll just put it in the nostril and um, and give one little pump. And that's all you need. Uh, maintain your your cartridge there. Make sure you let the next higher level of care know uh, what you gave them and how much. So again, for the purposes of this class, for testing purposes, um, you know, we're kind of showing you, we're showing you this or whatever as a, as a, uh, as you can see here, it says EMRs can give the medication only if they are trained in its use and have approval from their medical director. So remember that little part at the end, have approval from their medical director for the purposes of this class. However, whenever you get done with this class, this state, state of Mississippi, and multiple other states have deregulated naloxone completely. Uh, so you don't need anything. You don't need a prescription. You don't need a doctor's approval. You don't need a medical director, nothing. So, 
you know, me, you, your grandma, I mean, your dad, whoever can administer naloxone if we feel like we need to. Uh, so uh, that's the good thing about it is that it really has very few side effects. If you give it to somebody and they don't need it, um, generally it's going to just, you know, it's not going to do anything adverse and it's going to kind of work its way out of their system over time. And, um, and it's uh, for the most part, no harm, no foul. So uh, that's kind of why it's been deregulated and open to the market. Uh, like I said, you can, you can get naloxone at, at, at a, you know, a general um, uh, drugstore. So, uh, but again, just, just remember that for the, for the purposes of the class for right now, just that you, you would need to have approval from your medical director in order to, to administer it and have training. So hallucinogens, um, PCP, LSD, peyote, uh, mescaline, mushrooms, you know, there's, uh, there's several different types of versions of these over the years. You know, you, you hear a lot about these in like in the sixties and seventies, uh, you know, these were, these were really big. Uh, you still, sometimes you have some of these that are laced, uh, laced into other drugs or laced with other drugs. And, um, it gives you the effect of the one drug and also a little bit of the hallucinization and the feel good euphoric type feeling uh, from the from these. So uh, chemicals that cause people to see things that are not there. Obviously, that's a hallucinization, but it can cause you to have convulsions, you know, coma, heart and lung failure, stroke. Uh, you know, some of these things are very, very vivid. Uh, you know, there's reports of people that, I mean, have literally thought that they could fly, that would have jumped off of buildings. I mean, um, you know, that their heart rate just went through the roof um, because they were, you know, flying on a pink elephant or whatever. I mean, just you name it, the crazy stuff you can think of, you know, these people have, have gone through. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy stuff. And, and, you really have to watch out for these people. They are very unpredictable. Um, they are not uh, generally they they are not phased by pain whatsoever. Uh, there's reports out there. I know personally. I have a friend. He's he's uh, used to be a police officer. He's deceased now, but he um, he used to tell a story of a guy that was high on PCP uh, that he was fighting on the side of the road as a police officer, and he had he had to take his ass baton out and he was, this guy had him by the throat and he was beating his arms, both his arms with this ass baton to the point that he broke both the guy's arms and the guy still had him by the throat with two broken arms. So, um, you know, it's one of those things where you absolutely need to have, if you have for some reason, somebody says something about, you know, this generally, if there's some t something about a, an overdose or some type of illicit drug use, generally law enforcement is going to be called anyway. Uh, but if not, have them there with you, have them call to make sure that they're, they're responding with you um, just in case these people start to uh, have another bad trip. Again, try to reduce auditory and visual stimulation. Like I said, they, they, they're responding to, you know, some pretty wild stuff and, and, and they may have some some picture in their mind that is you know exacerbated by you know um, bright lights, flashing lights, that sort of stuff. So you may you may think about turning your turning your uh, strobe lights off and your siren off and that sort of stuff. So abused inhalants, uh, we mentioned that a little bit before. So intentional inhalation of volatile chemicals. Uh, many of these can be bought in hardware stores. We, we talked about paint, you know, spray cans and stuff like that. Uh, there's a few other ones out there um, where people just will, uh, you know, caustic chemicals, that sort of thing, where it essentially will deaden their senses. And um, but again, it can that they don't realize that it's actually doing something inside your body, and they may have, uh, you know, uh, cardiac related issues, breathing pro respiratory problems, that sort of thing. Uh, again, like we talked about before, uh, protect the patient's airway. Uh, make sure that their airway is not closing off. They don't have some type of inspiratory uh, chemical burn or anything like that. Um, give high flow oxygen and uh, monitor the patient's vital signs. You know, we're looking for that 
uh, probably a high, high heart rate, that sort of thing, uh, high breathing rate, and transport promptly as soon as we can. So toxic injections from drugs, like we mentioned, we mentioned this before as well. It's it's really kind of dependent on how much you get. It's kind of like a snake bite. Right? It kind of depends on how much you get um, <clears throat> and what the drug is. Yeah, it depends on what you're gonna what's what's going what's gonna happen to you. But um, weakness, dizziness, fever, chills, uh, and, and a number of other you know potential signs and symptoms there, uh, which most of which we've already covered. Uh, so. You just kind of big, big thing there is just trying to figure out what it was, you know, um, on the, you know, history taking side, biggest thing is, you know, a lot of times we just kick people out of the room. Hey, everybody else, everybody check out, go into the hallway. Let me talk to this guy for a minute and go, listen, man, I'm not the cops. Uh, you know, uh, I'm an EMR. I'm, I'm an EMT, you know, just, um, I, I, listen, man, you, you, something's bad is going on with you. You're, you, you know, whatever you took is not good. It's it's going to make you, it's going to make you sick or kill you. Um, you know, please just tell me what it was that you took or that you think you took, you know, and roughly how much you took, you know, like I said, there, I'm not here to charge you. I'm not here to take you to jail. You really just want to help take care of you and make sure that you don't, you know, something bad doesn't happen to you. A lot of times they'll end up telling you, uh, occasionally you have the, the defiant ones who are like, I didn't take nothing. I don't know what you talk about. As long as they're alive and they're able to talk to you, they don't care. They're, they're not going to say anything. Um, and they, they know that as long as they don't have anything on them physically, they don't have any drugs physically on them or paraphernalia physically on them, uh, on their person, then law enforcement is not going to do anything to them. And you can't make them go anywhere because they're, they're alert and oriented. And so you can't physically make them do anything. So, um, they don't care, you know, especially ones that have done it repeatedly and, and are habitual. They don't, they, they could care less. So they'll, they'll do it later on that night. So. So like I said, general, just in general drug overdose, um, you know, basic life support, like we mentioned, airway, breathing, circulation, looking for, uh, you know, the breathing pattern, see if it's, uh, it's, consistent with what we need to, um, uh, you know, to be able to support oxygenation throughout the body, right? Uh, we try to, like I said before, you know, during that time, we're like, look, man, you know, whatever you got going on, we're not here to judge you or just want to help you. So reassuring them, you know, hey, man, just let me, let, let's take you to the hospital. Let's, you, you know, get things checked out, see what's going on with you. And, um, and that sort of stuff. Again, it's 50-50 whether or not they'll go with you. Uh, again, if they've already overdosed and they're alive, uh, or I mean, if they're awake, then generally they 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 could care less about going to the hospital. Uh, like I said, if they are the big thing with naloxone, I'll tell you this right now: if you if they are not breathing appropriately, you know, so if um, if they're agonal breathing and um, they are they have any potential so you you have the you have some type of evidence you have paraphernalia there that you have you know syringes and needles or you know some other type of paraphernalia somebody says hey i'm pretty sure he overdosed i watched him do it or he told me he was going to do heroin or you know some other type of opioid that's all you need you just need a general suspicion that they have um that they have some type of exposure to an opioid and they are breathing is substandard, then we Narcan. Okay. If they're breathing on their own, they're just unconscious. I, I don't Narcan them. Okay. Um, for one, a lot of times the amount that we give in the pre-measured dose is, uh, again, four milligrams. And a lot of times the paramedic is only going to, is only going to give them a little bit just to keep their air, their breathing, you know, in check. Uh, but not so much that they just pop up and and are fully awake. So, uh, so that way, we're not uh, we're not dealing with a patient who is out of control, uh, but we do have a patient who is still viable. Their you know vital signs are good and and, and their ABCs are good. Um, so, it's um, it's one of those things where you know 
we don't want to give them um we don't want to just give them naloxone just because oh yeah somebody said they overdose but they're breathing just fine and they have a pulse and all that so if they're not breathing well enough so if they're agonal breathing or they have substandard breathing then we'll naloxone them okay and then we have some we have some reasonable suspicion that they um that they uh have been exposed to an opioid so again this could be now again especially with the stuff like this these days this could be um this could be somebody who is administering it to themselves so they they've taken the drugs themselves or it's somebody who's accidentally came upon it right so this could be uh you know parent or friend or relative you know whatever um who's been exposed to it because they just so happen to handle it and it it you know flew up in their face or they touched it and it got through their skin and then they've been exposed to it or a law enforcement officer or something of that nature uh, who's come across it um, or again one of you so one of you uh, may have been exposed to it not realizing it okay uh, you're doing a, a physical check of the patient and you come across this bag and you pull it out and all of a sudden you have it on you or again it aerosolizes gets in the air and you, you inhale it and you get exposed to it okay so very real it, it has happened and like just like that and so you may have to administer uh naloxone or narcan uh to one another okay so that's just a potential there and so if that's the case you know generally we try to uh head it off in the pass and just that so that way we have a better chance of making it to the er um or having definitive care come to us and us not having as bad a side effects So intentional poisoning, again, those attempted suicide type calls, which we get uh, fairly regular also. These, uh, this emergency treatment is the same. There's, there's, you know, there's really no difference. It's just one of those things where, uh, and again, this is one of those where dispatch uh, pretty much by virtue will um, send law enforcement uh, automatically. And a lot of times they will have to get there first. In these situations and any attempted suicide by any type whether it's by weapon or uh, poisoning or anything like that they'll have to get there first ensure the scene is safe and then have you come in um, and if that's the case then um, you know you, you like I said you'll have law enforcement there but if not for some reason it's something else it comes out the, the call comes out as something else and you get there and you realize it is an attempted suicide have have law enforcement respond immediately and um if you don't feel safe you know back out and wait for them but uh you know sometimes people are just very adamant that they want to kill themselves and you will um they will uh make sure that they do it so they may have taken a whole bottle of this or that to try to do that and then you came along and saved their life and once they come back come back to life you know they, they become coherent again they're like oh geez it didn't work i'm going to make sure it works so now i'm going to i'm going to take myself out and potentially i'm going to take this other person out so they won't mess with me again okay again people have a lot of different types of thoughts and feelings during this type of this type of scenario so uh, it's important to um you know have somebody there to to watch your back and, and have law enforcement there um but, um, you know, the patient, a lot of times, you know, if they're unsuccessful, they're going to be, again, over the top or at least, you know, emotionally distraught. And, and it's just important for us to kind of put on a different hat and not worry. So we're not necessarily worried so much about, um, you know, treating a medical problem as we are an emotional problem. So we're just trying to be a little bit more of an emotional support role there and uh, and help them through that time. So that's that's it for tonight like i said not not too long of a chapter there but uh it's important to understand that that these things are, are again like i said very prevalent um you know if you haven't already i know some of you in class here have responded to these things quite often like i have and uh and deal with this on a daily basis so it's uh it, it's just it's important to have a good grasp of these types of things uh, again not everybody who's been who's uh, having an overdose or who's been exposed to these types of things are bad people. So we don't try not to judge them that way. 
um, you know, uh, we, we do have them like that. But again, it could be somebody who uh, accidentally or mistakenly uh, was exposed to it. So again, there's a lot of different uh, variables there. We kind of keep it simple, you know, with our um, patient assessment. We want to make sure that we are um, we are doing everything that we can to um, get as much information about whatever it is that they took or that they were exposed to. Um, you know, whether it's a hazmat scene or whether it's an illegal narcotics, you know, overdose or anything like that. Uh, we want to get as much information about what that substance is, uh, what that chemical is, and, um, you know, what they were exposed to so that we can that's really going to what helps drive that patient care um, is knowing that information. So uh, being a good detective and, and asking them good questions and, and uh, kind of getting down to the bottom of it um, is going to be very helpful. So does anybody have any questions about what, anything we covered tonight? Last number. Yeah. So uh, before we do that, um, uh, Again, next week, oh, I'm sorry, Thursday is uh, Behavioral and Environmental Emergencies, Chapters 12 and 13, kind of short chapter. So um, that's why we have two of them. It's, uh, again, like I said, I know I, I looked at the grades earlier. Everybody's doing doing fairly well. Looks like you're kind of getting back in the swing of things. Uh, I know notice a few of you have two or three uh, outstanding quizzes. So, again, please try to get in there and get caught up. Um, Behavioral and environmental emergencies, kind of some of that kind of plays into some of the things that we've already talked about, uh, kind of expands on some of the things that we've discussed in medical emergencies. Um, and so we have several different things coming up, trauma, uh, you know, muscle and bone injuries, you know, pediatric emergencies, geriatrics, you know, things like that. So uh, a lot of a lot of good content that we have coming up. And, and like I said, I want to make sure that you guys are caught up and that you are um, you know, focusing on, um, focusing on the, the stuff that we have coming up and not having to backtrack and try to relearn stuff from before. So, um, the class number for tonight is, uh, R as in Robert zero, 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 eight, R zero, 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 eight. Uh, again, like I said, if you guys have any questions, concerns, comments, or whatever, please reach out and let us know uh, how we can help you. Uh, you know, if you're not understanding something or, or anything like that, we'd be happy to uh, have you talk about it. So if nobody has any other uh, pressing issues, y'all have a good night. Not John Boy.